it struck me last time that a rather short change to you in my uh, sketch, biographical sketch of Dunn, and I wanted to fill in a little bit of the details. I, I mentioned that he had eloped with the uh, Larry, Lady Egerton's niece, who was the daughter of Sir George Moore, uh, Lieutenant of the Tower, uh, a 17-year-old woman by the name of Anne Moore. Uh, her father, when he found out about their elopement, uh, was so outraged that Dunn felt, uh, and so they became secretly uh, married, uh, so outraged that uh, he, as I said, got him thrown into prison, fleet prison, along with a couple of uh, friends, Samuel and Christopher Brooke, who had also aided the uh, affair. Uh, he wrote to uh, Anne's father, and, and these are the words which he wrote, Sir, I acknowledge my fault to be so great as I dare scarce offer any other prayer to you in mine own behalf than this, to believe that I neither had dishonest end nor means, but for her whom I tender much more than my any fortunes or life else I could, I might neither joy in this life nor enjoy the next. I humbly beg of you that she may not to her danger, feel the terror of your sudden anger. She didn't, he did. He was thrown into prison. He committed career suicide uh, for his uh, efforts. And years later, uh, he summarized the experience in his typically witty fashion. Um, John Dunn, Anne Dunn, undone. Uh, he wasn't speaking about uh, divorce. He was speaking about the uh, end of his life as uh, in terms of its career ambitions. Uh, wasn't quite true, however, but it must have appeared so at the time. Um, he ended up having to look after a family. Uh, children followed. And when I say children, I believe there were 11 in total. Uh, his wife died uh, upon the 12th, I believe at the age of 35, and the child was born, uh, stillborn. Uh, seven of the children survived her. So it shows you something of the frailty of life in those days. But he was forced to scrape a living as a lawyer, uh, was helped by friends, one of them uh, of particular uh, importance and deserving of mention, Lady, Lady Maudlin Herbert, who was George Herbert's mother, and also Lucy, the Countess of Bedford. Uh, she played a role, both, both women played roles in, in Dunn's literary life. Uh, so he had friends, but these were very bitter years for himself because uh, Dunn was the uh, most talented of his peers, and he was cast into the proverbial wilderness. And he must have known that had he not done what he had done with Anne Dunn, he, he would not have been undone. And so uh, he, his career suffered for the very reasons that we mentioned in Bacon's essay, uh, of love as uh, due to an act of folly on his part. Now, in 1609, um, and this is, gosh, eight years later, uh, he was reconciled to his father-in-law. And uh, George, Sir George Moore finally uh, paid his daughter's dowry to Dunn, which allowed him to look after his family. Uh, but he still was not uh, finished with his career. He practiced law still difficult times, but he was employed by a religious pamphleteer by the name of Thomas Morton, a man who later became the Bishop of Durham. Um, and it, some conjecture that Dunn co-wrote, uh, or maybe even ghost wrote Morton's pamphlets. Um, and there are poems from this period, divine poems, uh, one called uh, Biathanatos, which was rather radical. In, because Dunn argued that suicide is not a sin in itself, rather contradicting the dominant view of the day. Uh, when he preached, uh, approached the age of 40, he published two anti-Catholic polemics, one called Pseudo Martyr and one called Ignatius, his conclave. Uh, these were a public testimony to Dunn's renunciation of his faith. Uh, the first of those, uh, Pseudo Martyr, uh, simply held that English Catholics could pledge an oath of allegiance to James I, who was the King of England at the time, without compromising their religious loyalty to the Pope. That was not an option open to him. 
but that won the favor of the king. And with the patronage of Sir Robert Drury, he wrote uh, other works, um, one of which is the work that we're going to look at next, and that is a funeral elegy, um, an anatomy of the world, the first anniversary, which was written on the occasion of the death of his 15-year-old daughter, Elizabeth. Sad occasion, but not unknown in the day. As I say, life was not only precious, it was frail at the time. One could at any moment, any given moment, uh, be taken of a fever and die. And I believe that it was in, in Calvin's Geneva, it was a requirement. Um, and in fact, it was punishable by excommunication if one did not order the elders to come pray for you if one was ill for more than two days. Um, but this poem, the first poem we are going to look at, uh, the first anniversary was written for, as I say, Dunn's wealthy patron, Sir Robert Drury. Uh, Drury's daughter, beloved daughter Elizabeth, passed away at the age of 14, almost 15 in December 1610. Now, on the surface of this poem, I'll get into it in the next video, um, it's a very dark poem. Uh, it's a world very much darkened by her departure. That's how her loved ones feel. They're in grief. Uh, Dunn makes a contrast, the contrast between this world uh, with the one that continues about its business uh, that doesn't even notice Elizabeth's passing, which of course causes offense to those who uh, very much can think of nothing else. Um, Dunn in this poem and I'm not sure that it's entirely successful, but I'll say more about that in a minute, uh, commemorates her loss uh, in ways that may seem a little bit cliched, but the conceit that he presents is brilliant. And the conceit is that of the microcosm to the macrocosm. What we lo lose in the death of Elizabeth is not a beloved daughter or an individual, we lose an entire world. The world has died. Now, Dunn clearly means this philosophically, but he also means it in a, in a Christian sense. And there are many, many different layers of meaning, and many of them seem to be reflections as much about Dunn as they are about the life of uh, Elizabeth, and probably to be expected since he is the one who's speaking in the poem. But he is very much talking about the topic that I've raised already a few times, that of cosmology and the significance thereof when he is contemplating and, and comparing Elizabeth Drury to the loss of an of, or the death of a world. So this is a meditation on death. It's a meditation on the meaning of death. Uh, it's also a contemplation on the very cosmological issues that I have raised in the first videos and the discussion of the significance of the new philosophy, namely Descartes, that costs that casts all in doubt in the famous lines uh, and new philosophy casts all in doubt. The element of fire is quite put out. And uh, I'll come to those lines when we look in the middle of the poem, but this is rather an extraordinary poem. Uh, as far as the genre goes, uh, we would call it an epideictic poem. Um, Aristotle in his rhetoric refers to uh, three types of uh, oratory, and the third is the demonstrative or epideictic. That's what this is here, but it's not rhetoric in this case. It's an epideictic poem uh, in the same way that we will see the uh, writings uh, by Sir Philip Sidney, his defense of uh, poesy. Sorry, check that. I'm, I'm misreading my notes here. Um, this is a, a this epideictic poem is a funeral elegy, and other examples of this we will be reading later in the semester include uh, Ben Johnson's "To Penshurst," which is the so-called country house poem. It's also an epideictic poem. Uh, we'll look at a variety of the country house poems, and I'll talk about how they also represent a sort of microcosm of the same sorts of themes that we see here represented in Dunn's 
first anniversary. But once again, the formal occasion of the poem is a funeral elegy uh, written to commemorate the loss of a young woman. And this is dedicated to his patron. But as we will see, uh, there's far more to it than that in the same way that in Mil Milton's Lycidas, uh, which is written uh, to commemorate the loss of a young man, we end up seeing Mr. Milton talk about far broader issues than merely the loss of a young man whom we're not sure that he actually knew that well. So let me begin with the a reading of the first few lines of the poem. And uh, his opening gambit here. Now, Dunn, it, to my mind, is uh, famous for his openings and introductions to his themes in the same way that Bacon is so brilliant at it. Dunn is particularly uh, bombastic often, but certainly arresting. Uh, so let me begin this. When that rich soul, which to her heaven is gone, whom all do celebrate, who know they've won. For who is sure he hath a soul, unless it see and judge and follow worthiness and by deeds praise it? He who doth not this may lodge an, in an inmate soul, but tis not his. When that queen ended here her progress time, and as to her standing house to heaven did climb, where, loath to make the saints attend her long, she now apart both of the choir and song, this world in that great earthquake languished, for in a common bath of tears it bled, which drew the strongest vital spirits out, but succored then with a perplexed doubt, whether the world did lose or gain in this, because since now no other way there is but goodness to see her whom all would see, all must endeavor to be good as she. This great consumption to a fever turned, and so the world had fits. It joyed, it mourned, and as men think that agues physic are, and the ague being spent give over care, so thou, sick world, mistakes thyself to be well, when, alas, thou art in a lethargy. Her death did wound and tame thee then, and then thou mightst have better spared the son or man. That wound was deep, but tis more misery that thou hast lost thy sense and memory. Twas heavy then to hear thy voice of moan, but this is worse that thou art speechless grown. Thou hast forgot thy name thou hadst. Thou wast nothing but she and her thou hast or past. For as a child kept from the fount until a prince expected long come to fulfill the ceremonies Thou unnamed hast laid, had not her coming thee her palace made. Her name defined thee, gave thee form and frame, and thou forgetst to celebrate thy name. Some months she hath been dead, but being dead, measures of time are all determined. But long hath she been away, long, long, yet none offers to tell us who it is that's gone. But as in states, Doubtful of future heirs, when sickness without remedy impairs the present prince, there loath it should be said, the prince doth languish, or the prince is dead. So mankind, feeling now a general thaw, a strong example gone, equal to law, the cement which did faithfully compact and glue all virtues, now resolved and slacked, thought it some blasphemy to say she was dead or that our weakness was discovered in that confession wherefore spoke no more than tongues the soul being gone the loss deplore so as we can see from the opening lines here uh dunn uh, makes the comparison uh, between the loss of Elizabeth Drury uh, to that of a world which hath died. It's not only the loss of a life and an individual and a daughter, um, but he makes the comparison uh, in the correspondences that I spoke of at the outset 
between the heaven and the earth, between a king and a subject, between a reason and the passions, between a father and a daughter, all of these are the microcosm, macrocosm relations. And he is going to continue on using this form of comparison, one that I say is not native or new to the Renaissance, but spans all the way back to the ancient world. And it is throughout Dunn's poetic corpus that we find this uh, figure being used, very characteristic of him. What is new to Dunn is the metaphysical conceit. Now, a conceit is a sort of metaphor. And in the case of a metaphysical conceit, it makes or compares things that are entirely unlikely, if not incongruous. Some of them we'll look at in later poems uh, and their famous poems. Um, and the, the object of comparison is so unlikely that it seems rather obscene. Now, the comparison that Dunn makes of the loss of a young woman to the loss of a world has struck many to be uh, bizarre and certainly overblown. But in uh, Dunn's day, it would not have been received so. It was um, a eulogy was intended to be fulsome in its praise, if not in ways that we might find to be overblown. But Ben Johnson, a friend of Dunn's, uh, was not a fan. He said that if it had been writ of the Virgin Mary, it had been something, would have made sense. This young woman uh, did not have the qualities to commend or to make the comparison uh, that Dunn was making. That was Johnson's assessment. Uh, Dunn's answer was reported to have been that he was describing not Elizabeth Drury specifically, but the idea of woman. Not everyone's satisfied with that explanation. Um, others have tried to conjecture who that other that woman might be then. Is it uh, St. Lucy? We'll come to that uh, elsewhere. Is it Astraea, the goddess of justice? Uh, does the she, uh, the woman uh, spoken of here, represent the Catholic Church? Uh, does it represent Christ, the divine Logos? Does it represent Queen Elizabeth? in a eulogy of sorts. Um, possible, but these seem to me rather stretched. Uh, it does seem to me that it is an epideictic poet, poem, a poem of praise, and extravagant compliments are simply part of the tradition. They are the norm, they're not the exception. And so the extravagant uh, extravagances that we witness in the poem are simply expectations of the genre and his contemporaries would have realized this and not seen it as a subtle form of satire. We will see that Don is indeed a famous satirist, but I do not believe myself that this is one of his satires, if for no other reason that it's written uh, to his patron, and his pa he's hardly likely to wish to offend his patron, particularly given the biographical details that I already gave you in the previous discussion. But let me turn back to the poem. Let's share the screen here again. But though it be too late to succor thee, sick world, yea, dead, yea, putrefied, since she, thy intrinsic balm and thy preservative, can never be renewed, thou never live, I, since no man can make thee live, will try what we may gain by thy anatomy. Now, let me say something here about the word anatomy. Uh, anatomy is the, um, is the division into composite parts of some, uh, the, the tomi there is to cut um, from a Greek verb for cutting, and it's to cut again and again, it's to cut it down into to small parts. And this is what he's going to venture to do from this point onward for line 60. So um, let me say a few words about that. Line 61. Her death hath taught us dearly that thou art corrupt and mortal in thy purest part. Referring to the world here. Let no man say the world itself being dead. Tis labor lost to have discovered the world's infirmities since there is none alive to study this dissection. For there's a kind of world remaining still, though she which did inanimate and fill the world be gone, yet in this last long night 
her ghost doth walk. That is a glimmering light, a faint, weak love of virtue and of good reflects from her on them which understood her worth. And though she have shut in all day, the twilight of her memory doth stay, which from the carcass of the old world free creates a new world and new creatures be produced. The matter and the stuff of this her virtue and the form our practice is. And though to be thus elemented, arm these creatures from home-born intrinsic harm, for all assumed unto this dignity, so many weedless paradises be, which of themselves produce no venomous sin, except some foreign serpent bring it in. Yet because outward storms the strongest break, and strength itself by confidence grows weak, this new world may be safer, being told of the dangers and diseases of the old. Now, let me stop that there for a second. I'll skip a few lines here and uh, come back to the poem. Sharing the screen. <clears throat> and can there be no worse sickness, line 93, than to know that we are never well, nor can be so. We are born ruinous. Poor mothers cry that children come not right, nor orderly, except they headlong come and fall upon an ominous precipitation. How witty's ruin, how imp importunate upon mankind. It labored to frustrate even God's purpose and made woman, sent for man's relief, cause of his languishment. They were to good ends, and they are so still, but accessory and principal in ill, referring to women. For that first marriage was our funeral. One woman at one blow then killed us all. And singly, one by one, they kill us now. Now, Dunn is making a uh, witty play on words here to kill in Elizabethan uh, slang is to have intercourse. Um, uh, we do delightfully ourselves allow to that consumption and profusely blind, we kill ourselves to propagate our kind. And yet we do not that. We are not men. There is not now that mankind which was then. When, as the sun and man did seem to strive, joint tenants of the world, who should survive when stag and raven and the long-lived tree compared with man died in minority? When, if a slow-paced star had stolen away from the observer's marking, he might stay two or three hundred years up to see it again, and then make up his observation plain. When, as the age was long, the size was great, Man's growth confessed and recompensed the meat, so spacious and large that every soul did a fair kingdom and large realm control. And when the very stature thus erect, did that soul a good way towards heaven direct, where is this mankind now? This is a song of lament, the Ubi Sunt. Where is this mankind now? Who lives to age fit to be Methuselah, his page, the oldest man in the Bible? Alas, we scarce live long enough to try whether a true made clock run right or lie. Old grandsires talk of yesterday with sorrow, and for our children we reserve tomorrow. So short is life that every peasant strives in a torn house or field to have three lives. He was working for three men. And as in lasting, so in length is man contracted to an inch who was a span. For had a man at first in forest strayed or shipwrecked in the sea, one would have laid a wager that an elephant or whale that met him would not hastily assail a thing so equal to him. Now, alas, the fairies and the pygmies well may pass as credible mankind decays so soon. We're scarce our father's shadows cast at noon. He's talking about the corruption of humanity. He's talking about what uh, 
we in uh, more scientific terms would call entropy. He's talking about not the improvement of mankind, but the decline of mankind. The, uh, this, the corruption, not just in terms of manners, but also the, uh, in terms of longevity. So now we have our biblical three score year and 10, where once we lived as long as Methuselah. And then he moves to another she, line 175. She of whom the ancients seemed to prophesy when they called virtues by the name of she. She in whom virtue was so much refined that for Ale unto so pure a mind she took the weaker sex. She that could drive the poisonous tincture and the stain of Eve out of her thoughts and deeds and purify all by a true religious alchemy. She, she is dead. She's dead. When thou knowest this, thou knowest how poor a trifling thing man is and learns much thus much by our anatomy, the heart being perished, no part can be free. And except that thou feed, not banquet, on the supernatural food, religion, thy better growth grows withered and scant. Be more than man. So he introduces this theme here now. The uh, extension of a man, which is otherwise withered by nature and by uh, time, is only re-extended through religion. So be more than man, he uh, encourages us, or thou, thou art less than an ant. Then, as mankind, so is the world's whole frame, quite out of joint, almost created lame. For before God had made up all the rest, corruption entered and depraved the best. It seized the angels, and then, first of all, the world did in her cradle take a fall and turned her brains and took a general maim, wronging each joint of the universal frame. The noblest part, man, felt it first, and then both beasts and plants and cursed in the curse of man. So did the world from the first hour decay. That evening was beginning of the day. And now the springs and summers, which we see like sons of women after 50 B. I will stop there and pick it up from that point.